thank you very much, Glocon. It, it's, it's actually a rare opportunity to speak to uh, this audience, and I, I appreciate that uh, I uh, am able to do it. Uh, the the um, last uh, 12 minutes of my talk is going to be about uh, nanoparticles that target diseases without symptoms, but since what we're doing here in creating this Institute for Molecular Engineering is rather special and uh, distinctive, I wanted to say a few things about this. The University of Chicago, in its first 120 years, had no engineering whatsoever, and in fact had actively rejected the idea uh, of having engineering, rather thinking that the job of this university was the world of ideas and pure science and, and so on. But under the auspices of our president, Bob Zimmer, in uh, the late 2000s, uh, the University of uh, Chicago decided to launch a, an engineering program. But when you're launching something you know, from this uh, vantage point, um, you have to think about, can you do something that the world really needs and that's distinctive? There are, of course, many good engineering programs in the United States and around the world. The philosophy that led to the idea of launching engineering here was that while we had good science, we were missing the creative interplay, as we heard a little bit about yesterday, between science, which is about curiosity and discovery, and engineering that's about application and invention. And it's not just a linear process from science to engineering, but it's a feedback process. Engineering uh, opens up new fundamental frontiers. So this institute is aimed at engineering, it's called the Institute for Molecular Engineering, aimed at engineering systems from the molecular level up. We are not building a school of engineering. You should think of us as some kind of combination between an academic research institute and a academic unit. Um, I'm considered a dean here the first year. It was the ideal dean's job, no faculty, no students. But uh, as I'll show you, we now have 15 faculty members. Um, and we are really trying to shift the focus on uh, how engineering education is done from traditional disciplines to what can engineering do. And it, it, one way to put this is, I'm, I, it's not that I don't believe in disciplines. My belief is that the discipline is engineering. How do you turn science into engineering? And if you're talking about topics that are traditionally taught, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, mass transport and so on, they can be taught without, you know, emphasizing what the name of the department is that you're teaching them in. So in this way, we're trying to build a unique University of Chicago approach to engineering research and education and focus on problems and training our students in this problem mode. So instead of departments, we have research themes uh, where we look at how molecular level building blocks, be they electronic chemical, uh, uh, biological, optical, mechanical, can play out in soft materials, uh, water resources, energy storage, quantum information, immunology, and other areas that are important for technology. We've chosen those both because of the initial faculty. We didn't, I didn't choose those in the first year <laughs> uh, in a void and then try to hire people into them. I went out and looked for the best people we could attract in the molecular engineering area, and then these areas started to self-assemble. As you can imagine, some of them relate to our partnerships with, with Argonne and, and other places as well. This is what our faculty looks like, literally, now. Uh, 16 people, including, and I've tried to group them in similar kinds of science areas, uh, immunology, soft matter, water, quantum information, energy storage. These things aren't perfect. People aren't required to work on the things that I've put them next to. But you get some idea of how we're distributed and how we're trying to fill in the interfaces that aren't so easy for a traditional engineering school to shape, reshape itself uh, when it started in these kind of traditional directions. So that's what we're doing. I'd be happy to talk with you uh, a little bit more about this. We do have a brand new building that's located two or three blocks from here. And we also occupy space at Argonne National Lab. Some of you heard Peter Littlewood talk about some aspects of this. And of those 16 faculty members, eight have joint appointments, which means actually that some program based at Argonne is paying their salary. So 
part of their salary, I should say. So um, students and postdocs move back and forth freely. So let me get to the technical part of what I wanted to talk about. Why are people interested, and I'm not the only one who's going to be talking about this this morning, uh, in nanoparticles in medicine? What, what can they do? I would like to say that they can be on patrol. They can target or home to regions of interest, typically pathological tissues. They can help us image them. And beyond imaging, they can help us diagnose what's going on there and uh, treat and, uh, in some cases, uh, prophylactically in advance uh, immunize against uh, some of these things. So these are all uh, applications that we and others are pursuing uh, in the realm of uh, nanoparticles in, in medicine. Uh, you can find many images like this, and they're starting to be commercial enterprises, Bind Therapeutics in Cambridge, for example, uh, where you can start to see philosophically how to engineer a particle at the molecular level, which fits right into what we're doing. And at a minimum, there is typically a targeting uh, molecule on the periphery, some kind of stealth or protective layer that keeps these things from being eliminated too rapidly, and then some kind of payload. Uh, this is, it's not always therapeutic, as, as I'll talk about. It can sometimes be an image contrast agent or, or something like that. But that's basically what we're talking about, and the important thing about these things is the modularity, the, the ability to build into a particle like this many different functions at the nanoscale, and uh, the size itself, which is in addition to whatever protective layers we have, the size can be an important ingredient in helping avoid the uh, too rapid elimination of these kind of nanoparticles before they home to the target that you want and deliver uh, the element that you want. We've uh, been working on a particular kind of nanoparticle, which are self-assembled nanoparticles. And basically, with, with a little bit of exception, they are particles where uh, we conjugate a peptide to some kind of tail that drives these things to form micelles. We initially started with hydrophobic tails, and in fact, our initial effort wasn't to make nanoparticles, it was to treat surfaces. So what you see here is a schematic image of a peptide conjugated to a hydrophobic lipid tail for the purposes of surface modification. We were initially thinking about uh, modifying the surfaces of stents or things like that to control abnormal tissue growth after uh, angioplasty and the insertion of a stent. Um, um, these kind of molecules, which we call peptide amplophiles, have advantages because they, um, when they're exposed to a hydrophobic surface, they know which end is up. They can, uh, they put their hydrophobic tail down on the surface, and in a more controlled way, that is a self-controlled way, uh, display the peptides pointing outwards. And we've done a little bit with that more than 10 years ago now. One can also uh, incorporate these kind of molecules into lipid bilayers, where you have a big aqueous interior and uh, carry some things that are water soluble, and we did some things with that early on. But over the last uh, five years or so, a little bit more actually, since we started this before we came to Chicago five years ago, we've been looking at these things, which are micelles. And notice the difference in scale here. There's a factor of 1,000 difference between 10 nanometers and uh, 10 microns. Uh, so these things are much smaller. The hydrophobic tails comprise the, um, com compose the uh, core of these things. And one can display a peptide corona. Uh, an object like this typically has 100 molecules in it. And it's typically 10 nanometers in characteristic size, something like that. Um, like in these layers and in these, one can make mixtures. So one can make mixed micelles that carry a set or a modular uh, uh, cassette of uh, peptides that can perform these different functions that I mentioned on the previous slide. That is, you don't have to have a peptide that does all of these things. Uh, you can take uh, regions of functional proteins um, that may be only uh, you know, 10 uh, plus or minus a factor of two or something like that to deliver these different activities. And we know how to make mixed micelles so that one can incorporate different functionalities into the same object. 
much of nanomedicine has been devoted to cancer, rightly so. Uh, it's an important target, and it's possible to use nanoparticles to good effect to target um, tumors or other kinds of aspects of, uh, of, uh, of, of cancer, cancerous tissue. However, more people die, uh, at least in the United States, annually from heart disease than they do of cancer. And the ratio of the number of people applying nanotechnology to cancer to heart disease is, I've never actually calculated it, but it's probably at least a million to one in favor of cancer. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that is. Cancer is often a little more frightening. Uh, children die of cancer and don't die of heart disease, but uh, nevertheless, heart disease is an important target as well. And so we've really taken that as our primary, one of our primary goals in nanoparticles applied to medicine. This disease starts with uh, a lipid buildup in the blood vessel wall uh, that produces inflammation. White blood cells enter the blood vessel wall and don't usually succeed in transporting the lipid out. And so what you end up with is an atheroma, a, a plaque of uh, lipid and dead cells. And all of that is you know, not terribly dangerous. What really matters is what happens after that. And all of this has to do with the nature of the fibrous capsule covering up the uh, atheroma or the atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, let me take this one first. If that capsule is robust and tough, the occlusion can continue to grow, but it grows stably, and uh, at some point you get symptoms. There's pain. If it's, if it's a coronary artery, there's chest pain. If it's a peripheral artery, it could be leg pain, but you can get it treated then. The dangerous thing is when the plaque is unstable or vulnerable. And at that, uh, under those conditions, the plaque often ruptures well before there's any symptoms whatsoever. And so the blood vessel becomes occluded by a blood clot rather than by the plaque itself. And that's the uh, issue that we're trying to, when, when you hear someone has dropped dead of a heart attack, it's often this. Um, so we have created these peptide amplophile micelles to be able to detect not only plaques, because we have plenty of ways of detecting plaques. There's CT and MRI and uh, ultrasound and so on to see if there's a plaque of some kind, but whether the plaque is prone to rupture. And for that, we've developed a peptide amplophile with a peptide on it, this CRECA, cysteine, arginine, glutamate, lysine, alanine, that homes the blood clots. Uh, a plaque that is about to rupture in a catastrophic way often, in fact almost always, has microscopic ruptures and is decorated with blood clots. And so our particle can home to the surface of a plaque that has blood clots on it and is prone to rupture. And uh, we've tested this in mice so far. We're moving into larger animals. Uh, mice don't get atherosclerosis. Uh, that's partly because they uh, eat healthy, and it's partly because they only live two years. But if you create a genetic knockout mouse that is missing the high-density lipoprotein that helps transport uh, cholesterol away, and you feed them what's called a Western diet, uh, they get heart disease, serious heart disease, in 10 weeks. Uh, so that's what's going on with this one, and you can see that after this conditioning, uh, there are buildups in the lumen of the blood vessel. So the first experiments we did was condition mice like this, inject a suspension of our mice cells into the tail vein of the mouse, sacrifice the animal after three hours, and then look at the blood vessels where these things had a green fluorescent label on it. No targeting, no fluorescence in the blood vessels, targeting with the CRECA peptide, and you see this. And here's a control experiment which shows that if you put in mice cells that have the CRECA but out the, without the label, and then come in with the labeled micelles, you get nothing again. That's because the unfluorescent label the micelles are taking up all the spots for these things to land. So we have a particle that can home to, to uh, vulnerable plaque. We are now thinking about how to translate this into earlier stage detection, either by detecting uh, inflammation or the elements that are upregulated on the blood vessel wall that uh, lead to inflammation. I'm not going to talk about that in detail. We also have a program to incorporate gadolinium into these peptide amplophile micelles 
so that one can see these in humans uh, by MRI. So that's the diagnosis part. The same modular micelle can carry a contrast agent such as this. And then there's the question of what can you do about it therapeutically. Early on, we tried to deliver, actually just to see if we could deliver anticoagulants, and we are able to deliver, as in this modular sense, we have a targeting peptide and an anticoagulant peptide, and we can show that we can deliver that to the plaque too. We're really not sure what we should do therapeutically. We have uh, other ideas. For example, if we make a micelle instead of by hydrophobic self-assembly, we make it by uh, polyelectrolyte self-assembly. That is, we make a molecule like this, where we have a polycationic tail. This will complex with nucleic acids and enable us to make a micelle of about the same size with the same kind of targeting elements on it that can home and deliver a nucleic acid. And so we've been looking at uh, uh, nucleic acid Sorry, it's so far down here, but nucleic acid inhibitors, maybe you can see it over there on the last line, nucleic acid inhibitors of uh, uh, things that hold back cholesterol uh, uh, transport or inflammation. And we can deliver these into living mice and show that if we do the same thing with the mouse, but at the same time treat it with one of these uh, uh, nucleic acid uh, microRNA inhibitors, uh, we get much smaller uh, lesion growth. So these are some ways of treating, uh, of, of delivering therapeutics with my cells. Another way, and I apologize for this, but another way that has been pioneered by Handan Achar, James LaBelle, and Matt Nuremberg is to develop a linker in our peptide amplifile that can release the peptide. So if you need to get this thing inside a cell for it to work, not just in the general neighborhood, uh, Handan and Matt have been looking at ways of releasing, and I'm sorry, you can't really see the data very well, but if, if, if you take this as a measure of how much of the peptide has gotten into the cell with the, uh, uh, this particular cathepsin cleavage uh, molecule, you can see that it's a lot more over here, that it's a lot more here than here, uh, where you don't have that uh, capability of cleaving off the peptide. We also, and, oh, this is my almost next to the last slide, uh, have been trying to use these peptide amplifile micelles as what you might call synthetic vaccines, either for um, T1 immunity or T2 immunity, that is cytotoxic T cells or antibodies. And the, the basic idea here is that this peptide amplifile can be like a depot for the adjuvant, or sorry, for the antigenic peptide and can be kind of self-adjuvanting. And we've been able to show that uh, in a very model system, we can uh, suppress the growth of tumors in a mouse uh, where these tumors are being attacked by cytotoxic T cells that, whose presence has been stimulated by these uh, peptide amplifile micelles. So back to what they can do. I think I've demonstrated uh, very rapidly in 15 minutes some ideas about how this can be done. And our argument is that self-assembled micelles are a really good vehicle for this. Thanks a lot.